Life's a serious business, and you're an important. You have a you have a deep intrinsic value, and if you don't bring it to the surface, the world is much lessened as a consequence of your failure. And it might be crucial, crucial what you have in you. I didn't really understand until I went on tour, I would say. I didn't understand how much people are starving for a word of encouragement. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that, that, that the desperate depth of that starvation and to see why that is, is so affecting. I guess I saw it most particularly in the case of young men. Mm -hmm. Not limited to young men, but that's where I could see it most, I don't know, grippingly in some sense. Because, well, you know, masculinity is toxic and human beings are a cancer on the face of the planet. We're an uncontrolled mm -hmm. virus and everything we do is destructive and we're leading the entire cosmos to perdition. And, you know, it's, those are deep doubts. And fair enough, I do believe in the environmental movement, there's a call, an unrecognized call to individual responsibility, but it shouldn't be purchased at the cost of the denigration of, of the human being. Now, I don't, uh, that's not helpful. It's, it's, it's a form of resentment and hatred disguised as, as ethical striving and it's deadly. And. And so I'm, tar I'm, I'm doing what I can to encourage, to encourage. Mm. I don't believe that human beings are a cancer on the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. I think that you eradicate a cancer. And if you have that view, then you might ask yourself just what it is that you're trying to do with your metaphor and why. It seems like young men have been deprived of this encouragement. And does it, is that that they seem to have been kind of not shamed, but discouraged for aiming towards the ideal or they have some sort of... Well, I had, I had a friend who committed suicide and, you know, he, he was a smart person and deeply troubled by questions of meaning. God only knows the full totality of the reasons. He didn't have a good relationship with his father. He had contempt for his father, who I knew and who I thought didn't deserve the depth of contempt that my friend had for him. But mm -hmm. in any case, he didn't have a good relationship with his father. And so that's a problem if you're a, a man, because you turn into your father, you know, so, mm -hmm. so that's a problem. But, you know, he came to believe that human activity as such was destructive. And so any ambition that he had was a malevolent in its essence. Mm -hmm. And so he tried to live a kind of nihilistic Buddhism, a self-negating Buddhism. He viewed himself as a, an agent of oppression. He wrote a short story once about living in northern Alberta. And he went, his, he moved around a lot when he was a kid. And he went to a small town, High Prairie, I think it was, uh, had a large indigenous population. So there were a lot of we, Indian kids. That's, that's the vernacular of the story. And he got beat up one day by a group of Indian kids and he wouldn't defend himself. I mean, he was 10 in the story, you know? He wouldn't defend himself because he was a colonial oppressor. Uh. You know, so you think a 10 year old can't think like that. It's like, yeah, yeah, they're smarter than you think. And so he didn't think he had any moral right to defend himself. And so that's just, and he was a sensitive person. And so, you know, and it's, it's a thorny ethical issue, isn't it? It's, it's not that he was thrown sideways by something trivial, but he, he killed himself. Well, I guess he isn't causing the world any trouble now, except the trouble caused by his absence. What, what do you think about his environment would have kind of... Uh, so how long ago was this when he had written the short story? Well, he, he probably died 20 years ago, and he would have written a short story about that 20, 22, 23 years ago. He had them published in a small collection. He sent me the book, 
and told me about it the day before he killed himself. Wow. So, I, and I saw him, you know, I, I saw this unfold over with him over a very long period of time. I wrote a little bit about it in 12 Rules and a bit in Maps of Meaning because mm -hmm. I knew him very well. And, you know, it, it, we don't want to allow the examination of our faults to turn into the denigration of our essence. And well, what should you imitate? Well, you you do imitate. You're driven to imitate by those you admire and respect. In fact, admiration and respect are the emotions that manifest themselves as part of the instinct to imitate. Well, what should you imitate? Well, you should imitate. If you're going to imitate anything, well, why not imitate the best? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the best? Well, the best is everything that calls out you to calls you out to imitate it. <laughs> That's what the best is. You see it and you see it and you're gripped by it because you admire someone. Yeah. It's like, why do you admire them? Where does that come from exactly? One of the things you do in behavior therapy constantly is you help people calibrate the zone of proximal development. So imagine that that's Vygotsky's term, right? And so if you're in the zone of proximal development, you're pushing your skill development one increment forward. And it's one that you can actually manage. And so if you see people who are entirely stymied, we're sort of back to the cup of coffee or the coffee cup example, you want to find something they can do locally this week that would constitute at least a micro win. And you just keep, and if, if you talk to someone, you say, well, why don't you try cleaning up your room? Because it's a complete catastrophic nightmare. It's a good place to start. And this is often the case with people who are really demoralized and whose life is utterly chaotic. And maybe they come back later and say, well, you know, I had one client. He, uh, he just had a child, eh? And he didn't want to mess up this child, but he was living at home. He was like 35 years old. He had a child out of wedlock by accident, but he didn't want to be a useless father. And he was very afraid he was going to be. And he had good reason to. Like, he still lived at home. He lived in his high school bedroom. And it was a complete bloody mess. He was living like a 12-year-old, you know, a bad 12-year-old. And so I said, well, when was the last time that your carpet was vacuumed? And he said, well, sometimes my mother does it, but it's probably been months. I said, well, why don't you just bring the vacuum cleaner into the room and, uh, just vacuum your carpet. That'll be your task for this week, you know? And I knew that was a bigger task than you might think because he'd been in that room for like 18 years and it was a mess. And so cleaning it up at all was a big deal. He told me that he dragged that bloody vacuum cleaner into the doorway and left it 45 degrees across the doorway and then stepped over it for the whole week without actually using it. Oh my goodness. It. Yeah, resistance, say, from, that was resistance from a psychoanalytic perspective, because he, he saw the monster and was paralyzed. And so what we did was we reduced the task. I said, look, you've got some drawers in your, in your bureau. They're probably a mess. Do you have a sock drawer? Yes. He said, like, clean up one half of the sock drawer this week. That's it, just organize it. So you just keep cutting the tasks down week by week until you find the threshold for positive movement forward. And then it's, what's cool about that too is there's a Pareto principle issue associated with it. So if you can find out where the person can start, it isn't linear progress, it's exponential progress forward. And so even if they have to start at a micro level, it doesn't really matter because they get much better at it very, very rapidly as they accrue successes. And so when you fall into anxiety, then there is this internal obsessiveness, which has to do with your pa the panoply of sins in some sense. Which parts of me are malfunctioning and need to be eradicated? And one of the things I used to do with my socially anxious clients, so they would go into a social situation, often with eyes downcast, by the way, and they would be so intensely concentrating on their own internal sensations that they would fail to make eye contact with anybody they were talking to. And then they would be awkward because they weren't reading the cues they could have read if they would have only looked. And then the conversation would become disjointed and then they would get anxious and fall into themselves and then it would just spiral. I see. And so one of the things that I taught them to do wasn't to try to calm themselves down, but to try to calm the other person down. So when you go into a social situation, pay more attention to the other person. Like just focus your attention outward. And if the person had any social skill, sometimes I had clients who had no social skills. 
And so they were anxious socially because they actually didn't know how to behave socially. So then you had to teach them the social skills. But some of them had the skills but wouldn't activate them because they were so neurotically obsessed with their own inadequacy that they failed to attend to the cues that would elicit the proper responses. And all they had to learn to do was watch. And then they would automatically respond because they knew how to have a conversation.